things about this conference is that it's a um, an unusual opportunity to have people from different medical specialties all working on patients with the same disorder uh, and seeing it from each other's perspective. And so I have to say that as a pathologist, I know nothing about physical therapy or issues associated with pain management or, you know, it's just been interesting to hear how other people see the same disease that I do. Uh, I'm a guy who traded the stethoscope for a microscope. And we pathologists look at what's going on in your body at the microscopic level. So we look at which cells are eating which other cells and who's winning the battle and who's basically losing it. I'd like to just acknowledge my collaborators, uh, Steve Astafiev, who's a, a Brown medical student that did a lot of the light microscopy work. Uh, John Donahue, who uh, is one of my neuropathology colleagues who uh, did much of the electron microscopy. And of course, uh, Dr. Klinga, who we all know and love. So just to reiterate a, a few things that other people have said, uh, tether, there's tethered cord syndrome and then there's a, a occult tethered cord syndrome. So tethered cord syndrome is caused by tightening of the phylum terminale, which is the human moral equivalent of the tail. I love that analogy. Um, there's a clinical triad that involves urological, orthopedic, and neurological symptomatology. Uh, we reviewed the radiology earlier, uh, and uh, Dr. Baker made the point that the conus medullaris, which is the end of the uh, uh, spinal cord, is essentially uh, lower than it's supposed to be, and uh, you can also have fat and other things uh, in the phylum associated with developmental abnormalities in the formation of the tail. Uh, histologically, uh, uh, if the phylum is thickened greater than two millimeters, uh, it's regarded as uh, a tethered cord and there can be increased adipose tissue, nerve fibers, and blood vessels. Um, it was mentioned a number of times that in occult tethered cord syndrome, patients have evidence of clinical, uh, a clinically symptomatic tethered cord syndrome without the hallmark radio, uh, radiological features uh, of a low-lying conus or fatty phylum. So this is just a diagram showing the, uh, the anatomy of the normal phylum. Uh, here's the conus medullaris. This is the bony spinal cord. Uh, the uh, spinal cord itself, the uh, part that's contiguous with the brain is covered by three layers, the dura, the uh, arachnoid, and the pia. Uh, and so this is the end of the spinal cord, which is called the conus medullaris. And so here is the phylum that continues as a sort of elongation of the pia and arachnoid, as well as the central canal within the spinal cord. So you have different layers, as well as the central canal that continue uh, the yellow stuff is actu actually the arachnoid membrane. So a part of the phylum is within the arachnoid membrane, and then a uh, small portion is beyond the limit of the arachnoid membrane. Uh, and eventually the phylum connects to the tailbone or coccyx by way of the coccygeal ligament. So there's an intradural portion of the phylum and an extradural portion of the uh, phylum. And so here in this space, uh, presumably you can have things like fatty tissue and, and other things that uh, are associated normally with the phylum. Uh, it's been mentioned a number of times that Ehlers-Danlos syndromes are a group of genetic connective tissue disorders characterized by hypermobility and hyperelasticity, uh, as well as tissue fragility. Uh, they're associated with various non-neurological and neurological conditions, including both tethered cord as well as occult tethered cord syndrome. Um, and the phylum has not really been previously examined uh, in the occult tethered cord syndrome that is associated with Ehlers-Danlos. Uh, and so our question 
uh, that we wanted to address was does the abnormal collagen in Ehlers Dan Danlos contribute to the pathogenesis of occult tethered cord syndrome in Ehlers Danlos patients? So, um, Dr. Klinga provided us with 92 phylum specimens uh, from patients with occult tethered cord syndrome. Uh, keep in mind that what we're really doing here is we're comparing people who do not have Ehlers-Danlos to people who do have Ehlers-Danlos. However, both have occult tethered cord syndrome. So one could raise the question, are these people who are non-Ehlers-Danlos people, people who simply have some other connective tissue disorder that we haven't really recognized yet? Uh, so I just want you to keep in mind that there may be some degree of overlap because both groups are actually experiencing the uh, occult tethered cord syndrome. Uh, so we use light microscopy to look at the adipose tissue, blood vessels, ependable lines, spinal canal, uh, connective tissue, dorsal root ganglia, nerve fibers, arachnoid membrane, and degree of inflammation. Uh, and then we use electron microscopy to examine collagen structure, elastic fibers, and axons. So the normal phylum is not the world's most exciting uh, anatomical structure. It's mainly composed of uh, uh, dense fibrous connective tissue, but within it there are various other elements, notably things like neurons that, that are part of the dorsal root ganglia, uh, and then there's also this uh, appendable lines continuation of the spinal canal. So here's just a higher power view showing some large neurons, a few nerve fibers, and again, the ependymal lined canal. Um, this picture is rather deceptive because there is some degree of inflammation here that using classical H&E stains, you can't really appreciate all that well. Uh, however, if you do immunohistochemical stains, uh, you'll see that within what looks like normal spinal canal, there are actually lymphoid cells that are staining here with CD45. Uh, um, and then there are also mast cells. Uh, this is a CD117 stain uh, where you see uh, mast cells. Now the funny thing about Ehlers-Danlos is that it's not uncommon to actually see more than one, you usually have to search really hard to find a mast cell. But in people with Ehlers-Danlos, it seems like they're not that difficult to find. And in fact, you can actually see two or three of them next to each other. So this is just a higher power view, again, showing two uh, uh, mast cells in close, close proximity. This is a GIMP sustain, emphasizing the um, uh, the granules that you see, the histamine-containing granules, uh, as well as other substances that you classically see in mast cells. So clearly they're there in Ehlers-Danlos, and uh, we don't see them in every case, but we do see them relatively more often in people with Ehlers-Danlos than in, uh, in the other non-Ehlers-Danlos occult tethered cord group. Um, and they're, I'm sure they're going to be much more common than in normal uh, con controls. So we basically looked at the histological characteristics uh, of the phylum in the two groups, the non-Ehlers-Danlos versus Ehlers-Danlos. So um, the green is uh, the presence of a particular feature. Uh, red means that it was absent. So you can see here, looking at the green, that in uh, non-Ehlers-Danlos patients, there were fewer dorsal root ganglia than there were in the Ehlers-Danlos group. Uh, also, in uh, non-Ehlers-Danlos patients, the phylum tended to be thicker uh, than in the Ehlers-Danlos group. Uh, so, in non-Ehlers-Danlos patients, the phylum terminality tended to be thicker, have fewer dorsal root ganglion cells, uh, and had no evidence of inflammation, as opposed to here in the Ehlers-Danlos uh, cases, where a certain percentage of them uh, did, in fact, exhibit evidence of, uh, of inflammation. We looked at five different histologic features, uh, the amount of adipose tissue, uh, the presence of blood vessels, 
uh, the presence of the uh, ependymal canal, nerve fibers, and arachnoid tissue. And you can see that in the non-Ehlers-Danlos, um, we actually used a grading system uh, where zero meant that nothing was present, uh, one meant that it was seen focally in a less than 10%, uh, clearly present was 10 to 50%, and abundant was greater than 50%. So that, that was a one, two, or um, three grade system. So you could see in the non-Ehlers-Danlos patients, there were more, uh, there was more adipose tissue. Uh, the vasculature, on the other hand, was more prominent in the Ehlers-Danlos group, uh, as was the ependymal tissue. Um, but roughly the nerve fibers tended to be roughly the same, as was true for the amount of arachnoid. Uh, so in the non-Ehlers-Danlos, uh, there was more adipose tissue, less vasculature, uh, less ependymal tissue, and roughly equal uh, nerve fibers and arachnoid membrane. This is just an example of a phylly fatum, um, uh, a fatty phylum, sorry. <laughs> Your piper picked the peck of pickled peppers. No, a fat, fatty phylum in a non-Ehlers-Danlos uh, patient. So you can hear, see here, this is classic adipose tissue. Um, in comparison to a uh, Ehlers-Danlos patient, where the vascularity is much more prominent. There was less evidence of fatty phylum, um, and the phylum itself tended to be significantly thinner uh, than it was in the non-Ehlers-Danlos group. So now we're gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about electron microscopic findings. Um, and just to mention the fact that um, the findings overlapped between the two groups probably because they're both not normal phyla. You know, keep in mind, we're not comparing two normal phyla, we're comparing two abnormal phyla, phyla to each other. Uh, so there was some degree of overlap, but we did notice a couple unusual things as opposed to straight linear uh, arrays of collagen. Uh, both groups tended to have this corkscrew uh, configuration of collagen, which was more prominent in the Ehlers-Danlos group. Um, the other thing that we saw more uh, commonly in the Ehlers-Danlos group was the presence of increased elastic fibers, which is what these black things are, uh, again, at the electron microscopic level. So as far as ultrastructural features, again, green is it was there, red is it was not there, uh, so there was a more abnormal collagen in the Ehlers-Danlos group. Uh, there were more elastic fibers in the Ehlers-Danlos group, and there were also more axons uh, present in the Ehlers-Danlos group. Um, and so the non-Ehlers-Danlos patient had less abnormal collagen, fewer elastic fibers, and fewer axons. So in conclusion, in non-Ehlers-Danlos uh, occult tethered cord syndrome, the phylum terminale tends to be thickened uh, and more fatty with fewer ganglion cells and nerve fibers. Um, in the Ehlers-Danlos occult tethered cord syndrome, the phylum is thinner, more vascularized with more ganglion cells and nerve fibers and a greater tendency to exhibit focal inflammation, including uh, the presence of mast cells. Um, in Ehlers-Danlos, uh, occult tethered cord, ultrastructural abnormalities of the phylum are more prevalent and are characterized by the appearance of corkscrew collagen and increased elastic fibers. Now, one of the problems that we have in doing a study like this is it's very difficult to get normal phyla from normal people. Uh, normal people don't have their phyla removed because of occult tethered cord syndrome, so the only place to really get it would be in an autopsy situation. And it's a fairly uh, you know, laborious task to get to the phyla in a normal uh, patient during an autopsy. It would require a lot of extra uh, time and effort in order to make that happen. Um, but as far as future goals, we'd like to add um, 
some special stains for different inflammatory markers above and, the, and beyond the ones that I've talked to you about today uh, to look for uh, uh, the inflammatory component a little bit more carefully uh, because it's easy to miss on classic H&E stains. Um, we'd also like to apply some quantitative uh, assessments to looking at collagen and elastic fibers at the EM level. Uh, and finally, we'd like to compare uh, the phylum of Ehlers-Danlos uh, and uh, with occult tethered cord and non-occult tethered cord uh, syndrome uh, with a tethered cord control group as well as perhaps some normal control phylum. Uh, so that's work that still remains to be done. Thank you. Thank you.